So we have got a really packed agenda looking at multiple angles on food. So I have the horrible job of keeping us to time. So I may need at times to go all Jackie Weaver on you and, and cut you off. I will try and give every speaker a minute's warning. Um, but yes, we may need to keep things moving quite sharply. Um, after today, we'll circulate a document with some support information in there, including links to the various presenters, organisations and projects. So without further ado, I'm going to hand on to Tim Gale, who's the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership Manager, who's going to give an introduction to uh, Zero Carbon Cumbria and give you a sense of the food sector emissions. Thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's great to see so many people on the on the call, uh, lots of familiar faces as well, which is always nice. Um, I think it's great that we're kicking off um, these series of uh, Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership training uh, events with, with food, as Karen says, it's, it's something that we can, uh, we, we can all uh, uh, connect to in, in some way or another, be that professionally or, or, or just as individuals. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, as Karen says, we're gonna, we're gonna try and capture quite a lot of information today, I think, and give uh, quite a few people a, a, a flavor of, uh, of, of what we've been working on in Cumbria, what's going on around food. Um, and then um, Nigel and I, and, and the rest of the Zero Carbon Cumbria team will, will think about how we follow this event up once we've, what, once we've seen the outcomes from today. Um, so as Karen says, I'm Tim Gale, I'm the Zero Carbon uh, Cumbria Partnership Manager. Um, we're working across um, uh, a number of different um, organisations. There's about 90 people that are part of the partnership now. Um, and uh, we, we, this, this topic, food, is covered with our uh, land use and um, agriculture uh, sector group work that is, uh, that is um, happening at the moment and, uh, and discussing these issues at the moment. Um, so uh, I, I will introduce that a little bit. Uh, more in more detail with a few slides in a moment, but I believe, uh, Nigel, we're able to to ask an initial question just to uh, get people thinking about this this subject area with a with a poll, um, which I know Nigel is ably ah there we are look at that just like that like magic I think we have about thirty seconds in which to answer this this question so uh, yeah fire away. Presumably, that's an annual figure, is it? Sorry, I missed that. There, there was a question there. My, uh, yeah, was it to do with annual figures? Uh, the sound broke up for me a little bit there. Yeah, I presume that that was uh, the answer should be an uh, an annual figure, is it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And the results are in, Tim, hopefully on the screen. Not yet, Nigel. <laughs> no, can't see that yet. Five tons, yeah. Hopefully you can see the results. The, um, there's a split of, of people answering between one, two, three and five tons. The majority are on three tons at 44%. Um, so you all well clued up because that's the figure that I've got. Um, approximate annual average carbon emissions in the UK. Thank you, Nigel. Okay, am I okay to share my screen now, Nigel? Yes, please, Tim, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thanks for everyone for taking part in that. Okay, hopefully this will work. I'll look for thumbs up. Everyone disappears from my screen when I, when I screen share, so I'll look for, for thumbs up once this is sharing, hopefully, fingers crossed. There we go. So I hope everyone can see this. Um, just a few a few slides to to take you through um, a little bit of the background of the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership, and uh, just to touch on very briefly uh, how what that looks like in terms of um, food emissions uh, in in the county. So the partnership first began to come together uh, in 2019. Um, that was from 
um, a commitment um, set out in the Cumbria Public Health Strategy uh, to tackle climate change. Uh, it, it was also from a, a, a leaders group meeting um, that came together in, in 2019 to, to look at how we can tackle climate change across uh, the, the county, working differently, working together, working as a, as a partnership. And as I say, there's 90 organisations now as part of, uh, part of the partnership across all sectors, um, from individuals uh, running their own businesses right the way through to organisations like the County Council, Environment Agency, Local Enterprise Partnership, um, and, and many, many others in between. Um, but the key thing um, for me for, that's quite unique about this work is that we're looking to, um, we're looking to deliver these programmes in a different way. Uh, and in a way that really engages communities in a different way, builds in the lived experience of communities, builds in the views of young people. So as we're shaping our carbon reduction plans across these thematic groups, uh, we're working really hard now to try and build in the views of uh, the communities, uh, build in the views of, of young people so that those plans are co-designed rather than written and consulted with. So I think that's a really, you know, it's an underpinning and fundamental principle uh, of the work we're doing, but also the way that we're trying to do it. And the strategies and the programs that we'll come up with that touch on food, we'll, we will look to do that um, across those areas, um, across that area as well, absolutely key. And you'll see that we've tried to understand and unpick what was in the Cum Cumbria Carbon Baseline Report in 2020 and break that down into these thematic sector groups to begin to understand what it is that we need to do across those areas um, to get us on the pathway to net zero 2037. And um, so we have um, a group working on those four areas at the moment, um, transport, housing, waste and land use. Uh, we're looking at setting up groups for uh, business and energy as well. Land use is obviously a key group um, for our discussion today we were hoping that we would have the lead from that group able to come along and, and tell us what, what they've been working on but unfortunately we've not not been able to do that but luckily I do go along to those groups as well so I'll just give you a quick flavour of what that land use um, net zero group has begun to look at um, over the last couple of months or so so we've been looking at what changes will actually be required from uh, land use and land use change in forestry to support that drive to zero. So a huge and complex subject matter that we've started to unpick across the group. And um, we've looked at what this will mean in terms of the challenges for, for our farming communities and farming businesses and um, the opportunities that might present as well. So I'm getting some, getting some feedback there. So I hope that's, uh, I hope I'm still coming, coming over okay to, to everybody. Um, we're looking at the opportunities as well around uh, what that means for, for uh, green jobs in the land use, um, land use sector, um, what, that means for, um, what that means for our visitor economy and, and, and our landscape, but also as well as those, um, those uh, economic and environmental aspects to that work as well, we're also very conscious to take account of the sort of societal elements of this, the, the just transition, um, people being able to access good quality and affordable food um, grown locally, thinking about what that means in terms of um, the, the impact on, on, on people as well as our environment and landscape. So very, very sort of um, broad and complex subject matter that that group's wrestling with. Um, we're also very conscious as well to connect up the work of other partnerships, the, work that the local nature partnership, for example, is doing at the moment through the uh, local nature recovery strategy is, is absolutely critical to this one, thinking about those co-benefits that we can achieve through managing our landscape differently as well. So we're trying to connect up those areas of common ground and, and areas of, uh, sort of um, shared objectives across our different work areas. Again, hugely complex, but we're doing our best to unpick it. Um, and finally, that group has, has started to touch on um, what this means uh, for farmers themselves in terms of the very very current that's happening right now, isn't it? And something that uh, our other speakers will touch on in more detail than I will, but what does this mean for our farmers? What, what's happening with the transition and the changes to farm payments, the impacts of Brexit, um, et cetera. So understanding and supporting farmers through that um, so that as new 
funding schemes come on stream that uh, we're able to make sure that um, we're, we're, we're supporting um, the farm as best we can through that process, um, particularly around accessing things like uh, um, carbon accounting, on-farm carbon accounting and understanding, um, understanding what that can do in terms of um, understanding car uh, farm carbon footprints. So just a little bit there about what that land use sector group is doing, and I'm very happy to provide more detailed information on that if anyone's uh, interested about the work of that group, as I say, without having our uh, expert and our lead on that with us today. So this is um, a lot of these points here, I think, are, are for this session, but also are, are linked and, and reflect the memorandum of understanding that's behind the work of the, the partnership in terms of how we're trying to go about doing all of this work um, across our transport group, our waste group, the partnership itself, um, work with communities, our work within the partnership, all of those things. We've tried to uh, look at the best way that we can do this in terms of um, ensuring that we're trying to move to points where we're seeking common ground. And hopefully the things on the screen here are, are enabling us to do this. And we've had some some good successes across those sector groups in bringing people together, working more collaboratively, um, really valuing everyone's contributions, uh, communicating in different ways, looking to inspire and motivate others. Uh, and really interesting from my perspective is hearing very different conversations going on between uh, organisations that maybe traditionally wouldn't have stepped out of their um, sort of areas of control, their areas of remit, if you like. So very much um, looking to work uh, across those those areas of, of common ground, which I think is really encouraging and hopefully something that we can uh, trigger in today's uh, conversations as well and as we move forward in our conversations around food. So just a little bit um, very quickly from, from me on carbon emissions um, from the food and drink sector. Now, um, we will, I'm sure in future se sessions, this in a little bit more detail and perhaps hopefully get um, some experts in to, to dig into this in a little bit more detail. But as Karen says, this is a pretty whistle-stop tour of, uh, of carbon and food today. So this is designed, these slides are designed just to give you a, um, a very short flavour, a, a bit of an introduction into just what food and drink means in terms of carbon emissions uh, in the county. So you can see that residents' food and drink is about 15%. The overall footprint, 83% from food purchased um, by residents and from eating out. So that's about a quarter of the total footprint. I think that's the really important figure to take away um, from this, that, that food and drink uh, accounts for about a quarter of um, the emissions in Cumbria. Um, and this, of course, also is, is important, um, not only from our residents, but also uh, from the people that visit us as well and what they what they purchase and, and what they eat and drink while they're here as well. And of course, that's also incredibly important for driving that local economy as well. So there it is in a, in a pie chart. So you can see that um, the residents total footprint is about 6.3 million tonnes of CO2 per year, about 12.7 tonnes per person, which I, I think I checked earlier, just to be 100% sure in my mind, is pretty much average for, for the UK. Um, but it's interesting how it, it, it varies a, a little bit from county to county. And I, I think there again, you can see in that orange segment that food is 25% uh, of the footprint. And interesting comparing that, I think, across to, to uh, other areas that we're focusing on and looking to tackle through the sector groups in the partnership, very much focusing on mobility, travel, how we move, um, the housing, uh, domestic emissions uh, in the blue there. Um, and, and food, what we're discussing today, clearly there that you can, we can begin to understand from that very simple graphic where it is that we need to be targeting our efforts as a partnership uh, collectively and also through those sector groups to tackle some of those, uh, those big areas of emissions. So I'm going to leave it there, given our tight schedule today. As I say, I'm very happy to um, pick up um, any, anything that I've raised there in more detail after the meeting with anyone, particularly around that, the work of that land use sector group, we can provide you uh, more information about what that, uh, what that group is working on. But I'll leave that there for now, Karen, and, and hand back to you. And hopefully, if my machine behaves itself, uh, stop sharing. 
Tim, I thought that you were going to be introducing us to Whiteboard so that ah. people can be putting in their thoughts as yes. we go. No. Um, there is. Thank you, Karen, for the reminder. I knew there was something else that I was supposed to um, slip my mind. But very importantly, hopefully, uh, Nigel will be able to uh, post in the in the chat. There you go. As if by magic, it's there mm -hmm. now. So we have something called a whiteboard. Hopefully, most of you will have used these by now. But if you click on the link in the chat, uh, there is a place there, as well as the chat itself, the Zoom chat, where you can put comments throughout the meeting. But the whiteboard's designed for you to uh, jump into that throughout the meeting. It will stay open after the meeting as well. That's important to say. So if there are things that you think of uh, as we uh, finish a meeting and things come to mind uh, later in the week, um, this will stay open for a, a month after this meeting, the whiteboard. So we've divided it up. You'll see when you go in there into a number of categories. Um, so you can place your comments um, against those categories or if there's anything else that doesn't necessarily fit in that, that category, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so that whiteboard is there to capture your comments and your thoughts and your ideas as we go along through this meeting, in addition to the chat facility. So I hope you find that useful. And any problems, please just post in the chat and we'll try and, uh, try and put that right. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Tim, for introducing us uh, to the day. So um, I can now hand on to David Hall from the NFU, who's going to talk to us about achieving net zero. Over to you, David. Well, for me, thank you. Yeah, I'll just um, <coughs> share my screen and hopefully it will, uh, this will, if the technology works. I'll give you a, a warning of when you're a minute. Yeah, uh, thank you. Can I, uh, let's just see if this does go from here and make sure you can see my slides and it's not on wide view. Can you see a whole slide? Can you see my screen now? A whole slide? We can see your screen. Uh, we can. Yeah, you're not in presenter view at the moment. Yeah, you... that's, it's, it shows the wrong screen. Just apologies. That's what I was worried about. Just one moment. Can you see just a slide now, Karen? Um, if you go to run slideshow at the bottom of the screen, yeah. then we'll just see the slide. Yeah, it's not coming up right. I thought this might happen. We can see quite a lot of it. So um, we're just also getting the slides down the side as well. Yeah, that's what we're about. Sorry, mm -hmm. I do apologise. That's what didn't to happen. It might work, David, if you click on from beginning, because I, I had the same yeah. problem and I clicked on from the beginning and it worked for me. But that coming up now, Tim. There you go. No. Look, I've said that and it won't work, won't it? No. Right, hang on. Uh, let me try and do it. I can it just let me see. I'm showing two things. Apologies, technical. We we do think that work and not uh... that better? It's still the same. Perhaps we, we just go with that if I'll that's it big it right. enough for people to see. Maybe you could increase the size of the slide itself. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I'm saying this on top of it. Slideshow just come up. If you click on that little down arrow on it, it's gone. Yeah, apologies. I don't know what to Okay, we'll try and go for it. Um, There's a suggestion that. to double click on. Oh, that's interesting. If you double, if you double click on from beginning, that might work. Uh, I've got my slide up here um, and not on the other side. Um, David, I would suggest just going with it as it is probably, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, I need to do to get mindful of time. Sorry about that. No worries, it's horrible pressure. <laughs> yeah, we, I'll tell you a little bit in where we are. Okay. Um, there you go. There we okay, sorry about that. All right, brilliant, okay, well done. So, <laughs> so I was asked, apologies, I'm David Hall, I'm Regional Director of the NFP for the North West. Um, I was asked to uh, talk about the NFU's um, 
desire and commitment to for NF4 uh, net zero for 2024 agricultural. Um, and in, in a way, I think the, the topic that we've got today is very broad in relation to looking at, at food. It was interesting, I think Libby's picked up on the uh, three tons of carbon on average per person. Well, I was told once, if you've got your hand in the fire and your hand in the freezer on average, you are comfortable. It's not a comfortable place to be. But I do think we need to be careful with averages in relation to uh, to saying where we are and, uh, and getting challenged. But our president, Minette Batters, um, gave the commitment over two, three years ago now that the industry would move to net zero by 2040 uh, and basically provide leadership in relation to what we wanted to uh, to do as an agricultural uh, agricultural sector. I'm really pleased to be here today representing primary producers of, uh, of high quality climate friendly, uh, climate friendly food. So what does net zero mean? So based agriculture is a biological process, essential to production. Um, and it can't be turned on and off as easily as alternative methods. There will always be a level of, emission, of emissions that are used or come from the production of uh, a primary production of food. But our 2040 net zero ambition is to reduce emissions re released to the atmosphere and also remove carbon from the atmosphere in relation to the activity that we can do around land use change. So basically net zero for us will be greenhouse gas emission balance. Our ambition is for an industry basis of, of net zero rather than the expectation for every farm to be able to achieve that. But we do see that some farms potentially could be, in effect, what my term is net, net negative in relation to what they're doing, have, in effect, have excess carbon on their farms. And other farms will really be able to, able to, be able to achieve net zero. But an industry, the ambition is hopefully it's something that we will be able to work, uh, something we'll be able to achieve. We've given 10 minutes to uh, to cover the topic and probably in reality is something we could speak for two hours on uh, alone in relation to land use, land use change. The graphic that you have in front of you now is one that is part of a document that we can circulate at the end that we, we produced and we've promoted to show the opportunities um, that farmers can do in relation to achieving net zero. And actually just to clarify, agriculture is actually responsible for 10% of UK greenhouse gas emissions. And from a point of view from a livestock production, that is only 5.4% when we take out the sequestration that farming can. The farming is very much a cyclic process that's producing products, taking CO2 from the atmosphere, turning into products that can come into the marketplace, which is energy crops, um, livestock production, and food crops that can go out onto the market. Some really good examples of alternative uses that are produced around Cumbria which is the willow that are produced and grown for, uh, for timber that goes into Riggison's for, for uh, timber production or paper production. It's a really good example of cross Cumbria of, of, of really climate friendly food and, uh, and farming production. So we are in a real positive position, just to clarify a little bit of, uh, of where we are and the percentages purely from the role that farmers can do. We do feel uh, we are part of the, the, uh, the solution to be able to achieve net zero across Cumbria. The NFU identified uh, three um, key areas or three pillars in relation to the delivery of net zero. The first one is resource use efficiency. And in fact, how can we become more productive and drive our productivity from agriculture? So looking particularly at nutrient efficiency, um, they're looking at feed efficiency, precision farming, environmental health. Basically very much we will know and things that's talked about in the industry, how can we produce more from less? Very much this makes financial sense for farmers and therefore how can we reduce the volume of carbon that's taken to produce an item that, uh, that goes out? How can we be much more efficient on farm? And we feel there are key opportunities to, be able to improve it across most farms. The second pillar then is around carbon storage. This is looking to add org organic matter to arable soils, maintaining permanent grassland, treat, uh, act, and looking at active grassland management, improving the quality of hedgerows, that we have more hedgerows, better, bigger hedgerows, planting and, uh, and managing trees and woodland more effectively, and uh, looking at peatland uh, and wetland restoration. There's some really good projects that are going on around the county in Cumbria in relation to looking at particularly around peat restoration. And this is the area where we look at land use, land use change. And the NFU has developed strategies in relation to, to tree planting, I'm really keen to be able to encourage uh, tree treatments um, um, as, as uh, potential areas are in relation to uh, afforestation. But well, some farmers are, are really concerned in relation to significant land use and productive land being taken out of production for tree planting. But we're really we're keen to see uh, the right tree in the right place. Some really nice initiatives uh, going forward in relation to hedgerows and, um, and tree planting across, across Cumbria. 
But we also see really good work being done in relation to managing hedgerows better. And we have run a campaign of, of looking at 20%, of looking at how we can get farmers to be able to manage their uh, hedgerows, but except allow them to become bigger uh, and manage them in a different way, again, to increase the level of sequestration of those um, hedgerows actually achieve. And the third, third and final pillar of what we're looking at is in relation to the role that farmers and land use can make in relation to delivering in relation to renewable energy sources. Solar PV is an example, wind, biomass heating, um, so bioenergy feedstocks, bio-based materials, anaerobic digestion, mini hydro, and also ground source heat pumps. So we feel across those three pillars, and in fact, we know the calculations and work that we've done by our team at uh, the head office in Stonley, that we feel if all these three areas are delivered by 2040, the industry can achieve net zero if we all work together to be able to uh, to achieve goals, which is really positive for us. The next slide looks at the areas in relation to the um, Climate Change Commission during a, 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 the report that was done. We actually looked at 18 different areas that the industry can do in relation to improvement. I know that Adam has a slide and he'll touch on this a little bit more detail when we ask in relation to what the farmers can actually do. So we feel that there's huge opportunities that farmers and land managers can do to add a positive contribution in relation to working towards net zero across Cumbria. But then we were asked in relation to what uh, more can be done to be able to support the farming community in the journey to net zero. At the NFU, you may be aware of uh, DEFRA put out a call for what they call tested trials, the environmental land management scheme. A number of these have been done in Cumbria in relation to nature recovery. And um, centrally, through our team at HQ, we did one looking at how we could use environmental land management in the journey towards net zero and the support that will be needed. One of the areas, Tim did mention it earlier, is in relation to actual greenhouse gas or carbon calculators and how can we identify the baseline on each farm and then the actions that need to be taken on each farm to be able to move forward, to be able to make the, make the decisions of where the improvements need to be. And also the potential for investment and support and finance to be able to make some of those uh, initiatives happen. But a lot of the things do actually need business support, advice, facilitation to actually get these things off the ground. So there are some barriers to the implementation at zero which need to be overcome, which are around low confidence, the cost, the time required to implement changes, and the uncertainty. And also there is real concern in the tenanted sector in relation to the landlord looking to make significant changes uh, to uh, an, an attendant. Uh, particularly around, around tree plants and the drive for tree. But we know that the farmers and the feedback we have from, from members across the region and across the county that they are keen to be able to, to move towards net zero and see this is a real opportunity because it makes financial sense for them within their, within their business. I think one of the th th things, that, again, that it's, that it's important to is that we maintain and drive, uh, continue to drive productivity and production from Cumbria and make sure that we maintain the level of farming that we, uh, that we deliver because we can deliver climate friendly uh, beef and lamb and dairy products from the county and make sure that we can get them into local supply chains uh, across the area. Again, if we drive, if we don't produce it in Cumbria, in fact, in the county in the northwest, who will? And therefore, we need to ensure that we don't offshore our responsibility and then somebody else be producing it actually far more class, less um, climate friendly than we are. We also have the uh, CL, a Centre for Innovation in Livestock. It's based over in, in York and they're doing significant work in relation to looking to achieve net zero. So it's important that any of the decisions and uh, actions that we take. One minute on, left, David. Thanks, Karen. Based on science that we can move forward uh, and make sure that we have a, have a positive impact. Good time to final slide. Basically, we have uh, a document to see online and we can share around. It's engaging with local authorities to look at the opportunities to be able to deliver net zero. Very much when we come to food, we feel agriculture part of the solution. Uh, agriculture has much more to offer than just trees and tree planting. But it's vital that we look at food and food for local production and food procurement and how we can actually link together the quality food that we produce into local markets and really keen to explore opportunities to get greater levels of local food into public procurement opportunities in local authorities. We see that as a, as a real positive in what we're doing. The farming sector has so much more to offer uh, Cumbria, we look at it's mentioned earlier in relation to natural capital of how we can really get people out to enjoy the countryside and again, be able to use the food and consume the food as locally as possible in a climate friendly way. 
Okay, Brilliant, please, David. Perfectly to time, despite your technological challenges at the beginning. Thank <laughs> you very, very much. Um, so without further ado, we can pass on now to uh, Adam Day from the Farming Network, who's going to talk to us for 10 minutes about the key role of Cumbrian farming in tackling the climate crisis. And don't forget to stay busy and chat and on the whiteboards, folks. We can see your screen, Adam. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Day. I'm the Managing Director of the Farmer Network, uh, a not-for-profit organisation that supports farmers. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you here about the key role that Cumbrian farmers might play in climate change, um, with an overall view of food, of course, which is important to us. Um, uh, what I'm going to have to do is go into um, that give me a little bit to, so there we go so i thought it might be good to set the scene with what farming actually means to cumbria in terms of the scale of farming you might be interested to know that uh, defra statistics 2016 showed that there are over 5000 farming holdings in cumbria which equates to 5% of the uk total those holdings actually farm over half a million hectares that's 1.25 million acres of farmed land and that's almost six percent of the uk total of farmed land there is no grade one land that's the sort of land you might get in the fenlands or parts of west lancashire that specifically can grow vegetables we don't have any of that land in cumbria you might be surprised to know there's very little grade two land there's a little bit in the eden valley there's a little bit on the solway plain most of the land that we have in Cumbria is grade three, which is uh, mainly grassland, pasture land for farming, grade four as well, a little bit rougher, and grade five, which is up on the hills, which uh, um, farms very little other than um, some, some very hardy hill sheep in Cumbria. In terms of what we are farming at the minute, 2016 data shows that we're currently farming around 2 million sheep in Cumbria, which is substantially less than it was in those uh, far off times sort of 20 or 30 years ago when uh, production was at um, its, its strongest um, and all the challenges that that brought with it. We also have about 56,000 head of beef cattle and 108,000 dairy cattle producing 900 million litres of milk annually. Cumbria is actually the second largest dairy field in the whole um, of the, I should say England rather than the UK but you can see that we're a very substantial producer of food products. And through all of that, there are almost 13,000 people employed in agriculture and forestry within this county. What does a business community say? Well, this comes from the um, local industrial strategy report of 2019. It says that farming shapes the rural economy and the natural environment in Cumbria. It says that far the farming community provides the social glue in rural areas. It says that farming underpins the visitor economy, and we're all very well aware that we have 20 million visitors to Cumbria annually at this moment in time, making up to 40 million visits, uh, and that is likely to increase in future years. In economic terms, 2016 data shows that uh, farming, um, the agricultural sector in Cumbria uh, generated 250 million pounds towards our gross value added. 40 to 1, what does that mean? Well, of course, behind every farming business, there are up to 40 of us, and I'm one who's included, who make a living from supporting or supplying or working with farmers, some entirely and some to a lesser degree. But behind every farm business, there are up to 40 other businesses that are part of the very same chain. Farming is changing. That comes from a, a, a document produced by the government looking at the future role of farmers and the direction of travel. What do we want our farmers to do in future? Well, we're here within this group to focus on tackling climate change. That's obviously a key area. And one which we heard from David Hall is, is something that farmers are definitely up for the challenge for within Cumbria. And we must never lose sight of the fact that farmers are there to produce food for an ever increasing population. By 2050, the data suggests that we'll have an extra 10 million people in the UK, as well as an expanding global population, and they will need fed. 
and also improving the natural environment. So the new support schemes that the government is talking about, ELM, providing uh, public goods, um, this is all becoming part of the future farmer's role. And those are the three main sectors which we're going to need and we're going to ask our farmers to take a key role in, in future. And to me, the biggest challenge is not focusing entirely on one, two or three, but it's how we balance all of these three. Focusing then on climate change, David mentioned that UK agriculture is about 10%, which, uh, and this is the good news, um, as he's talked about, farming is actually quite unique in many uh, industries in that we mitigate through uh, carbon sequestration. So yes, we produce it, but we also store it as well. Uh, and the good news is that farming, as David mentioned, and we'll come on to that little slide, um, farming can deliver uh, uh, successful um, solutions to improve uh, um, everything to do with greenhouse gas emissions and how we can reduce them in future. And this is the, apologies, David, this is a slide I pinched off you, um, the six carbon budget, and, and he mentioned this. And I, I think what's great about this is that it's already there have been identified a number of possible farming practices that each uh, together um, will uh, help to reduce emissions in the future. And there's so many areas in farming to look at, livestock breeding and, you know, how, how we breed our animals and, and the traits we breed into them, the feed that we give them, where that comes from and how it's sourced and uh, how, how uh, successful it is for animals to utilize, the type of cover and crops that we grow in future. A lot of talk about regenerative farming in the uh, um, coming up uh, now. We're, we're looking at all areas of that now. Waste management is obviously a big one with the new farming rules for water and livestock health. Um, part of this forms the government's plan under ELM, but a lot of this is about how, as David said, we can produce more from less inputs. And on the right hand side of that, you can see all the areas of the farm that we can look at in future. And um, we won't go into any great detail, but we're looking at peatland um, starting at 12 o'clock. Um, we're looking at low carbon practices. We're looking at diet. Forestry and trees is obviously a massive one. Concur with everything David said, the right trees in the right place. Hedges, such an easy one. The, re, the, the reinstatement of hedges that we've lost in the past, so simple, so effective. And energy crops, as David mentioned. <clears throat> I won't go into any more detail because I know I'm short of time. Um, so focusing on climate change, I will make a statement to you, which you may or may not wish to challenge, that I think farmers are one of Cumbria's best assets when we're talking about combating to, uh, climate change. But in order for that to happen, we need things to happen. What is needed? Clearly, in order for farmers to take up the challenge of climate change and food production and everything else, we need investment. We need support in the right place. We need to help our farmers and educate them in practices that they've never had to work with in before. Remember, since the First World War, Farmers for generations have been told to produce, produce, produce. This is a whole different game and it brings with it a whole different set of skills and challenges. And we need to do that. And in order to make this easy for us and to work with us, we need trust, we need respect and understanding. Um, we can see many occasions in the media and everything else where farming tends to get a bit of a rough ride. Um, those of us who hopefully understand our industry and what we provide, have a very different view. And I think in all of the comments and, and, and the discussion we'll have about climate change in, in future, we really want some trust and respect and understanding because we have to realize that farmers want to produce food. They want to farm animals. It's part of our history, our heritage. And actually, according to the figures, we need more food. We will need more food in future. And Cumbria, as I hope my figures have shown, is a county that is very capable of delivering more food than we do now. In order to do that, in terms of partnership and cooperation, we're going to need training. Particularly, I'd like to think we need to talk to our young people. In future, their job role won't just be to be brilliant farmers, food producers, dairy people. One minute. Thank you, Karen. It, it won't just be the farm. In future, our young people will need training and support to become food producers and environmentalists, all part of the same package, part of the same job description. 
But if we can work on that basis in the future, if we can look at all the wonderful things that are being talked about, establishing local food to local people in future and those new opportunities, then we're on the right track. And I'll leave you with one thought. It came from the NFU uh, um, event that's just taken place, the uh, AGM. A farm which is not profitable cannot be sustainable. And that's something we need to think about in all of these things as we focus in part on climate change. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, and again, thank you for keeping to time. There are a few questions in the chat. If, um, if any speakers actually spot questions they can answer in the chat, then do feel free to do so. Um, so as we know, Adrian Bamford is uh, unfortunately unable to join us today. Um, so we're going to move straight on to uh, Chloe Tringham and Hanny Cox, who are going to talk to us about reducing food related waste. And they're from Cumbria County Council and the Zero Carbon Cumbria Waste Sector Group. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for the introduction. So just bear with me while I share my screen, if that's OK. Brilliant, we can see that. You see it, everybody see that? OK. Yeah. So yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction, Karen. Um, so I'm Chloe Tringham, I'm the Senior Manager for Environment and Regulatory Services at Cumbria County Council. But for the purpose of the session today, I'm wearing my hat as Chair of Waste Carbon Reduction Group. And I'll pass you over to Hanny soon, who's the Partnership Development Officer. So just the purpose of our few slides today, I know it's a, a bit of a whistle-stop tour of slides from all present presenters, but just going to explain a little bit to you about the background of the Waste Carbon Reduction Group, which is part of one of the ZCCP Waste Sector Groups, which you will have seen on Tim's first, first slide. Um, but I'm going to focus particularly on the sort of the, the food work stream as part of that group. Uh, I'm going to cover off an overview of current food waste disposal arrangements in the county, particularly around residual household food waste. Um, highlight uh, existing projects and techniques to reduce food waste in Cumbria and then I'll just summarise the future sort of national policy context going forward. So this sort of just a bit explains in a bit more detail um, what Tim's first slide explains. So where the waste carbon reduction group in, in the middle there, um, it feeds into, oops, sorry, touching the screen too much. It feeds into the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership um, and it also feeds into the Cumbria Strategic Waste Partnership. So that's a partnership that's been quite well established uh, for a while. Um, and it also feeds into these other, the other sector groups. So again, Tim mentioned them, housing, rural energy, transport, those sector groups. Um, and we also feed in and from other policy areas and synergies such as the LEC, the Chamber of Commerce, etc. So the Waste Carbon Reduction Group itself, um, it's formed up of the County Council and the six district councils. So the logos there you can see uh, below the group. Um, we've also got two community representatives, um, just about to launch a youth representative on the group as well. in a little while is the partnership development officer that supports the work of the group. The actual purpose of the group is to lead a sector-led approach towards reducing carbon within waste in Cumbria. It's primarily due to um, local authority membership and having no formal private sector membership so it's predominantly around household waste. However, there is a strong focus on influencing and engaging, such as I mentioned, with the other synergies between the LEC and the Chamber of Commerce. So although we focus on that household waste element, we're still quite keen to, uh, to obviously work with others in synergy. So this is some of the action that we, we're sort of working on to try and reduce food waste um, and also that sector overlap so you know working in synergy with those other uh, sector groups uh, so there's some examples here I won't read all of them out um, but the community composting scheme I'll mention a little bit more about that 
um, engagement on food waste reduction and redistribution within schools. So the waste reduction team are working really hard uh, with schools to try and reduce um, you know, food waste. Um, a little bit about the community fridges and freezers projects. Um, and then over here, we've got the role of um, anaerobic digestion, which we've heard about earlier in presentations uh, and supporting the decarbonisation of the energy grid. So there's lots of work going on. Obviously, there's always always scope for more, and that's where we're working working towards as a group. So just a little bit about food waste disposal in Cumbria. Um, so I just need to set the scene, but I won't dwell on this too much. Um, so food waste is currently within the re residual waste stream, so household residual waste, black bag waste. And it's treated as part of the waste disposal contract that we have with Renewy, uh, which commenced in 2009 and ends in 2034. So that's a 25 year contract. We've got two mechanical biological treatment plants, uh, one in Barrow and one in Carlisle. Uh, they take all of the waste. So there's very uh, small amounts of waste that go to uh, landfill. Um, but studies have shown that separate food waste collection would result in the organic content changing. So that would necessarily lead to some changes affecting uh, those operations at the MBT plant. And also we've got a guaranteed minimum tonnage, which would also be impacted on. In the context of, of separate food waste collections, um, DEFRA are currently looking at engaging with local authorities particularly those with MBT plants to assess the impact and address the contractual and financial implications. So obviously this is a sort of, you know, this is an area that we have to consider, but we don't want it to um, stifle in any way the opportunities that are available to us. So I'll now hand you over to Hanny, who will just give you some stats. I know you've had quite a lot of stats in the presentations, but um, here's, a, here's a few more for you to add to the collection. Over to you, Hanny. Great. Thanks, Corey. Um, so as Corey mentioned, just to give a bit of an overview in terms of food waste in Cumbria, what the tonnages look like and the associated carbon impact. So you'll see the first two bullet points there, Cumbria specific statistics. So this was based on a RAP study, which they completed for the Waste Partnership back in 2015. So seven years out of date, but I think it probably gives us the best indication um, that we have to date in terms of what food waste is and, and what waste stream it's coming from. So you'll see just over 80,000 tonnes per year of food waste um, recorded through that report, generally 50-50, a bit more in the commercial food waste stream. Um, national data, typically based on compositional analyses, food waste consists of around 30% of residual waste stream. It does differ, there's milk, for instance, poured down the sink. So it's likely to be over and above that 30% figure, but that's just what is collected. Um, through um, household waste collections globally. So using international figures, food waste generally is responsible for eight to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's the RAP figure. As a group, we've been looking to, to delve down a bit deeper into the data locally. We feel that's important if we, if we want to know where we need to get to, which is net zero and supporting the 2037 date. We're not entirely sure yet in terms of the carbon benefits of moving from MBT to AD. This, the, appear to be less obvious than energy from waste or landfill uh, which as Chloe mentioned isn't the case in terms of where we're coming from in Cumbria so once we have that level of information we'll be able to um, to, to to kind of develop up time scales to work to to get to net zero. Um, next slide if you could please Chloe. So this slide we've added on to give uh, an indication on the the interrelatedness of collections and the treatment infrastructure so uh, we'll move on in, in a bit in, in terms of the national policy context and separate food waste collections coming on stream for all local authorities. Um, you'll see on the left hand side is a graph, graph worked up by RAP and that shows the percentage of households across England with a food waste collection over the last 10 years, steady increase of those householders with separate food waste collections and also a decrease of those with a mixed food and garden but then as you'll, when doing the maths, there's just over half who don't have any food waste collection. And then you'll see on the right hand side, that is a graph based on a RAP Unomia report, which is the same 2015 one I just touched on. And that highlights the identified 
anaerobic digestion and in vessel composting facilities in and around Cumbria. You'll see on, on the map in terms of where Cumbria is highlighted, there is a huge lack of uh, capacity of organic waste treatment infrastructure. And it, we just wanted to put that up because it highlights how treatment very much informs, is a key consideration in informing what food waste collections look like and when they can come into force. So I'll hand back to you now, Chloe. Okay, Tally. Oops, I want to keep moving. Just one minute left. Yeah. All right, thank you. We're through then. Um, so just one of the sort of really good examples and, um, that we've come across that we've been working with for a long time is a low food hate waste. Um, campaign so um, you know looking at the scale of the problem love food hate waste say that the largest impact of food waste is in the home around 70 percent uh, which does provide an opportunity for us to reduce it through engagement with householders um, that you know they've got that statistic there about the average UK family throws away 720 pounds worth of food each year so we've got a real opportunity to obviously uh, tap into that. There's lots of um, campaign materials and tools that are available as part of Love Food Hate Waste. Um, and there's localised action in Cumbria. So the Waste Reduction Team offers free community workshops um, in order to run through Love Food Hate Waste campaigns. We've got a master composter programme of volunteer advisors out there to encourage own composting of the food that is left over and and a report that's worth looking at is a RAP report in 2020 which demonstrated and, and showed that separate food waste collections significantly associated with a lower total household food waste arisings which means as behaviour changes there's less food coming through. Um, just there a quick stat in terms of global food loss and waste if it were its own country it'd be the third uh, largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So this just again just explains a little bit more, gives you some information about love who love food hate waste campaigns that we've got. So there's a, who to contact there. We've got the master composter program that I've mentioned. So it supports the sales of reduced price compost bins and food waste digesters as well. So the, this information will get shared around. Annie, do you just want to explain about the national policy and then we'll wrap yeah, up? Of course, yeah, yeah really quick. You, can you keep it really quick? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Really quickly, so where we're currently at the moment, we're waiting for final confirmation from DEFRA in terms of what the details for food waste collections look like. But it's now in the Environment Act, so it's not a question of if, but when and what food waste collections look like and what disposal arrangements look like. Likely to be in between 2024 25 up until. 20, 30, 31, dependent on if you have a mechanical biological treatment plant, which is the case in Cumbria. Um, we're likely to see statutory guidance in the next few months, which will then inform planning in the next, you know, in the medium term. Um, but yeah, I'll just hand back to you, Chloe. Yeah, so I won't, I won't pick up on this slide, Karen. I'll hand it back to you, but it's just a summary of the points I think we've picked up today. Um, Brilliant. On the waste hierarchy. That's, That's great. great. Thank you so much to Chloe and Hanny for a great double hander. Um, so if we could move along sharply to uh, the next speaker, Alison Pye from Cumbria County Council Public Health Team, who's going to be talking about the importance of food to public health and well-being for 10 minutes. Hi, yeah, thanks Karen. Um, hi everyone. So um, I'm just going to provide a really brief overview of the importance of food and the food system to our health and well-being. Um, and I've um, get, certainly um, tried to stick with the, uh, um, limiting that um, to sustainability. So um, next slide please. So um, worth, always worth starting off with a quick quote. Um, so this is from the Eat Lancet report back in 2019. So they said, food is the single strongest lever to optimise human health and environmental sustainability on earth. So we've got a really huge potential here um, to, make, to make, a, um, make a big difference. Um, so next slide. Um, so quickly, um, quick overview. I'm just gonna talk about how the food system impacts on our health. Um, 
talk a little bit about the diets that are good for our health and also good for the planet, um, talk a bit about the um, health implications of uh, biodiversity and access to green spaces, and then um, just give a really quick overview of some opportunities, potential opportunities for action. Uh, next slide. So the food system, environmental sustainability and public health, I think, interact on loads of different levels. But I think broadly, we can say they overlap in these five key areas that I've just listed on the right. Obviously, too much to cover in 10 minutes, um, but I'll just touch on a few of those topics. Um, so next slide. Um, and if we start off by thinking about the connection between the food system, climate change and health, um, as we've already heard, I guess the relationship between the food system and climate change is really strong and it's circular. So our food system is causing climate change and in turn, climate change is negatively impacting on our food system. But in turn, we know that the changing climate is having a significant impact on our health. Um, and in fact, it's been identified as the biggest global threat, um, threat to health that we currently face. Um, so I won't go into all of these, but um, listed here at the bottom of the slide are just some of those health impacts, uh, impacts of climate change. Um, and we know that those health impacts don't affect everyone equally. So our most deprived communities are affected to the greatest extent. So any action to reduce the climate impact of our food system is also essentially act action to improve our health and um, health inequalities. Um, so next slide. In addition to climate change, our food system affects our health um, through a number of other environmental impacts. So we know, for example, that the global food system um, is a significant contributor to um, biodiversity loss, drought and uh, water and air pollution, all of which um, are harmful to our health. And in particular, something like air pollution in the short term can um, exacerbate respiratory conditions such as asthma, um, but it also increases the risk, increases the risk of a, a real range of long term conditions such as stroke, heart disease um, and cancer. Um, next slide. But turning away, I guess, from the sort of wider food system processes to the food we actually eat, um, we know that our current diets are also uh, bad for our health. So in 2018, The Lancet uh, published the latest findings from their Global Burden of Disease study. They found that over 15% of deaths in the UK, almost one out of every six, were attributed to poor dietary habits alone. Um, so, and, and although you don't necessarily need to be overweight to be made ill by an unhealthy diet, Diet. Um, we know that overweight and obesity are, are a, a big problem. Um, two thirds of adults in, in Cumbria are overweight and obese. Um, so a huge problem. And that's associated with a range of medical problems, um, some of which are listed here on the infographic. Again, I won't go into those uh, but we can now add um, severe COVID-19 disease to that long list. So, um, um, so lots, lots of health implications. Next slide please. And it's just worth highlighting that like climate change, our diets contribute significantly to inequalities in health. Um, so there's a range of dietary related diseases um, affecting some groups in society more than others. Um, and there's just some examples on the slide here showing um, the effect that income and deprivation has on the likelihood of developing a range of diet related diseases. So you can see that as deprivation increases, the risk of death or illness also increases. And there's loads of other examples um, of similar inequalities between different groups. And it's important to say that this isn't about um, poor choices in these groups. These patterns are largely driven by inequalities in the what we call the social determinants of health, so the conditions in which um, people grow and live and work. So, for example, inequalities in the basic lack of access or ability to afford um, healthy foods. Uh, next slide. Um, so just to give a couple of examples of that, um, we know that unhealthy food is cheaper per calorie than um, healthy food and making it more making it a more accessible option to people on a low income. Um, and we also know that people living in deprived areas tend to be surrounded by more junk food. So there's a clear correlation between poverty and the density of fast food outlets um, with almost twice as many in the most deprived areas compared to the least. So in those um, what so-called food swamps, junk food is everywhere, but actually fresh ingredients are much harder um, to find. 
Next slide. Um, so what should we be eating? Um, so the good news is that a healthy diet is also a climate friendly diet. Um, the Eat Well Guide, which is pictured here, provides that national guidance for a healthy balanced diet. And when they reviewed that in 2016, um, they incorporated sustainability for the first time. And again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but um, possibly one of the most notable changes was the promotion of plant based proteins. Um, and we can also see uh, that fruit and vegetables and starchy foods, especially things like whole grains, remain the biggest part of that plate. Um, and it's thought that if we could all adopt this sort of diet, we, we would not only live longer and more healthily, healthily, actually the overall carbon footprint will be reduced by almost a third, um, we'd have a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, 17% reduction in water use, so um, significant implications for both our health and the planet. Um, next slide. Um, and along the same lines, um, this is just an overview of the British Dietetics Association, um, they, they, the BDA, they produced an environmentally sustainable diet. Um, so again, I won't go into this, but for those who are interested, there's loads more detail on the One Blue Dot toolkit. That contains very similar guidance to the Eat Well Guide and also to the international um, Eat Lancet dietary recommendations that uh, many of you might have seen for a sustainable diet. Um, well worth a look if anyone is interested. Um, next slide. Um, so, um, oh, we're going back a bit. Back one slide. That's, that's the one. Um, and so, um, it's so, but as I say, it's not simply enough to be telling people what constitutes a healthy, sustainable diet and expect everyone to eat it. Um, we need to make the healthy, sustainable choice the easy choice. So that means ensuring that everyone can access and afford the quantity and quality of food that they need to stay healthy. And that requires action to address those food swamps that we talked about to work with our schools and workplaces um, to tackle food insecurity and to really get down to those causes and those wider determinants of health and poverty, deprivation, education, employment, obviously not easy, um, but essential if we're going to, um, uh, to, to make any, um, any improvements. Um, uh, next slide. Um, and uh, so it's not just about what we eat that can be both good for our health and our planet. Um, changes to the local food system and communities also has um, significant co-benefits. So, for example, schemes that promote um, local agriculture, grow your own, um, community edible gardens, um, projects to restore um, and protect biodiversity and um, green and blue spaces. They're all good for the planet and they're also good for our health. So, um, so again, some real opportunities for some co-benefits and I've just listed some of the benefits here um, on the slide. Um, so one um, minute. Yeah no great moving on to the next slide. So this is this is my last slide um, and apologies it's quite it's quite full um, but and uh, it was just a sort of list of potential opportunities for action because I think there's loads and loads as we move forward um, to a more sustainable, healthy food system. I'm sure there's loads more. Um, so I think there's opportunities to build on um, uh, work to plan a healthier food environment to improve the availability, accessibility and affordability of healthy, sustainable foods with a focus on our areas of deprivation. I think there's opportunities to work with our local NHS, social care, um, employers, education settings on the food environment and procurement. And um, that's already been mentioned earlier today. Um, we should be encouraging and enabling people to get involved in food growing, involving the community in targeted rewilding and nature recovery projects, looking at targeted waste, uh, food waste and food poverty um, by redistributing Right, by redistributing surplus healthy food to organisations who are feeding people in need. And I think um, also we can be linking in the activities of this group and other relevant local food initiatives with um, social prescribers in the NHS and the local authorities so that the health benefits of those things are really amplified. Um, so that was a really, really quick whiz through. Um, and I've included a whole load of references at the end of the slides in case people are interested to read anything further and also have happy if anyone wants to contact me afterwards. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, 
we've now got a scheduled five minute break. We've had quite um, a whistle to stop tour so far. So I think um, we're a little bit running a little bit late, but I think we need to take that five minute break. So please come back um, at uh, 10 past three on the dot and we'll continue with the rest of the programme. So go and stretch your legs. It's kicking off. Oh, thank you for the recording. If you don't want to be recorded, then do feel free to put your um, camera off. Um, so we have Georgina Smith and Sarah Page from the National Trust um, taking us through a case study on healthy and sustainable food at Stickle Barn in Langdale for the next 10 minutes. Thank you, Karen. Uh, can everyone hear and see OK? Yep. Yep. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everyone. As uh, Karen said, Sarah and I are just going to take you through some of the work that Stickle Barn's been doing in terms of um, becoming a low carbon pub and some of the different areas we've been tackling to get there, um, along with looking at the carbon footprinting of our menu, which I think we were the first pub to ever come footprint our menu. So we'll take you through that as well. Um, my colleague Sarah is leading on the first bit of the presentation, which is looking at our sort of renewable energy journey and how we've driven out energy in the cafe. So I'll pass to Sarah. Hi there, can everybody hear me? Very good, right. I'm not going to turn my camera on due to bandwidth, but here we go. So as George just alluded to, um, Stickle Barn was the trust pilot restaurant for the introduction of um, the carbon accounted menu. So for the integrity of that project, we, it was really important that we considered carbon holistically at Stickle Barn. So as part of that, renewable feasibility studies were part of that process. Um, and so today, 60% of Stickle Barn's electricity is generated from its own hydro. Um, from those initial studies, um, we know that there's more that we can do. But the point is, we know what those opportunities are. So that helps us to continually plan for a more sustainable future at Stickle Barn. Can I have the next slide, please? And if you want to go on for, for one more slide for me. So 60% of our energy at the moment is coming from the uh, hydroelectric turbine, which we're connected to. Obviously, not, everybody, not everybody's got the access to a fast running gill to generate renewable energy, but that was an option for us. I'll pass back to you now, Sarah. That's brilliant. Can you all hear me still? Yeah. Good. <laughs> so um, identi identifying the biggest en energy consumers helps us to shape the future strategy to reduce the carbon at Stickle Barn. So things like energy and water consumption, we are continually monitoring and that data is analysed and we can look at that for opportunities where we can reduce that carbon footprint. We're really careful. So replacement catering equipment's really carefully selected for its energy performance and efficiency. Um, it was identified, for example, Sticklebound Cellar is its biggest consumer. So the beer cellar chillers were upgraded to new ones, energy efficient models put in place. And then um, even simple things like plastic partitioning was put up in to reduce the area that the chiller was needing to keep cool. So the volume of air needing to be chilled was smaller. Can I have the next slide? Again, some things can be really, really simple. We need to adopt processes within the kitchen to avoid energy waste and subsequent carbon waste and really simple things like stickers on high energy intensive equipment just stating switching on and off times is really effective i think the point to this slide is sometimes don't overlook the smaller actions when you're looking to drive down your carbon footprint because sometimes the really things are just there right in front of you can i have the next slide Um, one thing we did discover, so energy saving and carbon reduction actions, they're not obvious to everyone. And for a process to be successful in reducing carbon in the kitchen, we needed it to be consistently adopted by the whole team. Um, so to help embed those changes, um, we've got a library of really accessible resource and it's full of checklists and tips on how to reduce carbon and reduce energy consumption within the restaurant. We also developed um, a voluntary role for a green champion to help promote that best practice within the teams. And just these things all together were really effective. Can I have the next slide? 
I think this is you, George, isn't it? Sorry, Georgina, you're on mute, please. Thank you. Sorry, I switched off on my device, but obviously not on the other side. Um, so as the County Council was saying earlier, what you can do to reduce food waste is really important in terms of carbon, carbon saving. 12% uh, of the carbon footprint of food comes from food which is actually wasted. So any food um, industry, cafe or restaurant should be looking to avoid waste uh, at source wherever possible and driving out that waste to save money and obviously reduce carbon at the same time. Um, when you end up disposing of your waste, obviously then that's, that's costing you money, even if it's recycled or disposed of latterly. So uh, we seek to avoid where possible. Uh, next slide, please, Nigel. So there's been various things we've done at Stuckle Barn in terms of reducing food waste. Um, and forecasting is an important part of that, looking at historically what people have, have eaten and uh, looking at the weather, which has obviously been a, a bit crazy of, of late. Um, and that's necessitated getting rid of some food. Storm Arwen meant that we had to suddenly close and uh, get rid of a lot of food. So we were able to distribute that locally to the to the school actually in, in Great Langdale so that that wasn't wasted. So that's always a useful thing to do to quickly redistribute food. Uh, what we've also been working on at Stickle Barn is reducing portion size. So getting that just right. So everything on the plate is eaten rather than being disposed of and uh, contributing to carbon emissions that way. Uh, we also reduce menu diversity. So um, if you've got a perishable item, spinach, for example, make sure you've got spinach in three dishes so that you're not, so you've got more opportunities to use that up. We cook fresh, so we do need to make sure we use up those ingredients. And we carefully record uh, what we do throw away as uh, for trend analysis going forwards. And we also have a food waste collection from Olico where milk waste also goes in that food collection as well, because milk going into uh, private sewage systems is a nightmare. So we need to make sure for water quality for the lakes that we dispose of that milk in with the food waste. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we buy locally where possible, supporting uh, agriculture and uh, local farmers in, well, in the Langdale Valley and, and farther afield in terms of buying local meat. Um, some of our other sourcing is more done centrally through procurement. So I was looking at the people on this call thinking there's scope to do more and better in terms of our, our vegetable supply chain. So I think we can we can look to improve that um, post Brexit. Just getting staff and getting food has been has been a bit of a challenge. So there's things we need to look to redress now that we're kind of coming into a bit more of a stable, stable period. Next slide, please. Um, as already mentioned by, I think it's Alison earlier from, from Public Health, um, what we eat uh, affects our health and what we eat affects the carbon emissions associated. The two dovetail as, as shown on Alison's slide. So we need to dial up the amount of fruit, fruit and veg that we eat as a proportion of our plate and dial down the amount of meat, uh, fish and dairy that we eat because that obviously uh, carries a much higher carbon footprint. It's more efficient to eat the plant than to eat the animal which eats the plant. Um, but as part of a balanced diet and a sustainable approach, we do source some meat uh, locally from our suppliers, um, which is, is uh, increasingly driving down its carbon footprint through some of the farm carbon calculators you've seen before. But I think, yeah, it's all about that, that balance of a healthy diet. And as we say, eating more vegetables, and we, we show that through our menu now, we have predominantly uh, vegetarian meals uh, with more fruit and veg. And I'll pass back to Sarah for the last slide. Next slide, please, Nigel. Okay, so, um... In terms of the carbon reduce menu that was developed, we worked alongside a, a firm called Small World Consulting and established a carbon footprint of Stickle Barn's menu items. So they developed a tool for us that contained the data set of the carbon intensity of the individual food items. And we can then use that tool. So we input the carbon um, calculator for into that carbon calculator the weight of each individual ingredients within a recipe and that then is added up and gives us a total carbon for that recipe we can then divide that by the number of portions and then we get the carbon footprint for each meal on the menu um, we can we can also use the tool to identify where 
high carbon items within recipes can be swapped out for lower alternatives. So helping to drive down carbon everywhere we can within each meal. Um, a caveat to that, I would say, it's not perfect. Um, carbon accountancy is still very new. Um, in some cases, the data simply isn't available or the level of complexity is just too great um, to be able to differentiate between the differently produced versions of maybe the same food element. Um, try and give you an example. Um, let's do lamb, let's go there. So um, local farmers lamb, so something that we buy really locally, would potentially have the same carbon footprint accounted to it as a lamb that had been potentially reared further away. So we know that there are bits that can improve, but that can only get better in time as the methodology behind those calculations continue to develop. So we, it's just something to bear in mind. Can I have the next slide, please? You could finish up soon, that would be great. No worries, last slide. Um, so ultimately what we wanted from this menu was um, our understanding of the carbon footprint behind our food to be shared with Stickle Barn's customers so that they can get make informed choices. Um, so we created a menu for Stickle Barn that offered a really good variety with plenty of appealing low carbon options. And then we printed that carbon footprint alongside each dish on the menu. Um, the resulting menu that we produced had a 23% reduction in carbon compared to previous menus. Um, so currently that menu is based of around 66% of that menu is vegetarian, 34% of the meals would offer a vegan option and meat was making up about 29%. Uh, that 29% will, will change in the future as the idea is that with subsequent menu offerings you'll be able to add meat on as a, almost like a bolt on so add it to the as an extra to a plant-based dish on the menu so um, things will change as we go on um, what was great customer and media response was really positive and we've seen a 20 percent increase in customers choosing plant-based meals at stickle barn and that's it Brilliant. Thank you very much. That was great. Really interesting stuff. So um, moving on, we've got a, another case study um, from Lynn Barnes of Vista Veg, who is going to talk to us about homegrown here for the next 10 minutes. Over to you, Lynn. OK, thank you. Uh, right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the local food production and, and retail model that we've been developing. I suppose it's been a bit organic in several senses over the last decade or so. Um, we're a small growers, uh, veg growers cooperative based in the Eden Valley, and um, we're one of the partners in the Zero Carbon Cumbria partnership. And we're also running one of the projects as part of the Zero Carbon Cumbria program, which is called Home Grown Here. We've been growing uh, veg and running a, a small veg box scheme for 12 years now and we operate within roughly a 12 mile radius of our base here in Crosby Ravensworth. Um, when we first started uh, we had 20 box scheme members, um, but very small and that was really largely as a result of me going to a farmer's market and um, um, well <laughs> twist, twist in the arms of, of, of 20 local families uh, to see if they would be happy for me to grow veg for them. So uh, that was a long time ago and year on year that's grown um, and we now have 250 box scheme members um, and they receive either a, a weekly or a fortnightly delivery from us. Um, for those of you that don't know what a box scheme is, it's um, most generally, uh, it's uh, a, a box of locally produced fresh veg that arrives at your door delivered um, and uh, you, you can ensure that it's local, it's fresh and most often it's organic as well. There are some large boxings across the UK, but um, normally they're quite local um, to a particular area. So there's now seven of, seven of us in the co-op. Uh, we started with just three, that was myself and two farmers. Um, and we're a mix of field scale and small holding growers. Um, we're pickers, we're packers, we're deliverers. 
Um, we grow communally uh, in five polytunnels and across a two and a half acre field and um, a one and a half acre orchard. So as you can see, quite, quite small and four out of the seven of us grow collectively. Um, we're all part time, at least I was part time until uh, COVID, uh, but everyone else, we all do other things as well. Um, we also run Grow Your Own Veg courses. Um, we deliver education work in local schools. We work closely with our local food banks uh, to, to manage waste. Uh, we open our gates annually for Open Farm Sunday. Uh, we host apple juicing days and um, we undertake some consultancy to work around local food growing as well. Uh, we grow organically, although none of us are certified on our own holdings, um, and we're all increasingly interested in uh, implementing no-till principles to improve soil health. Um, that all sounds fabulous and rosy, and it's been, uh, it has been a really exciting uh, journey over the last 12 years, 12, 14 years. But the flip side of that is that we're growing at about 800 feet above sea level, um, in the north of England and on relatively heavy soils. So we've never been able to grow absolutely everything that we include in our veg bags. Um, and so we've, we've made a commitment to buy in in order to make sure that our box scheme customers receive a, a standard, uh, standard bag of veg each week. So we, we made a commitment to, brought, to buy in as locally as possible. And really over the last five to six years, that's that I found that much more difficult because um, with older generations of growers retiring, uh, selling off their land for property development um, and generally leaving the sector and positively discouraging their young sons and daughters from taking that on um, that, uh, because they found it difficult to find a local market for what they're producing now that supermarkets are monopolizing that retail sector. Um, so. The Homegrown Here project, which is part of the Zero, Zero Carbon, Carbon Cumbria program, was essentially to try and encourage more local fruit and veg growers um, and to secure markets for that produce that they're growing. And of course, we're working hand in hand with the wider uh, ZCC program, which is busy raising awareness uh, across the county of how we can all usefully reduce our environmental impact, um, which in, of course includes our eating and our food purchasing habits. Um, so this time last year, um, I put a call out uh, through uh, the local farming community uh, to see if there were farmers who would be keen to grow at least one acre of veg or fruit um, for five years of the project. Um, we had, um, to date, we had about 30 expressions of interest um, and last season we started uh, growing with five farmers um, who grew a variety of crops from all different places around the county. I've got a really short two minute film that I'd like to share if I can. Um, Homegrown here is a, a grower-owned cooperative of local producers based in Cumbria. Several growers from around the county growing a variety of, of different fruit and veg, carrots and potatoes, swedes, turnips, a whole range of peas and French beans. In terms of its growers, Homegrown here will really support them through advice and skill sharing, through providing machinery and equipment, through funding seed and plant costs up front so that they take less risk themselves at the outset by giving them a, a branding for their farm as part of the homegrown here generic brand but also the main thing for them is that homegrown here will create a route to market for all the crops that they produce and in fact will be the single marketplace well that's the aim for all fruit and veg that's being produced within the county 
Our growers are growing conventionally and organically. That's great for the environment, for responsible growing, growing in harmony with nature. A lot of the crops that they're growing require hand picking, so that's better for the environment and also better for the local economy. We're uh, trying to reduce waste as well. We pick a little bit of wonky veg, not a lot, but we do try and include some. And you might get 10 carrots that are perfect, but you might get one that isn't. I think it's important for everybody to understand that they're all perfectly edible, there's no difference. The ones that aren't used, we feed them to the cattle on the farm here, so there is no waste at all. It's been part of a project called Zero Carbon Cumbria, a partnership of big organisations who are keen to get Cumbria to a point of zero carbon by 2037, and it's funded by the National Lottery Climate Change Fund. The real benefit is lower food miles, people eating much more seasonally and keeping their purchasing and their commitments to food within the county. So, as you can see, Homegrown here is about uh, providing a, uh, or creating a supportive environment for new growers and uh, a guaranteed market for whatever they're growing. They're now all crop planning uh, together for 2022, and uh, that kind of means that they're, they're growing exactly the quantities that we know we can sell, uh, which clearly is, is good for food waste at the point of production. Um, the homegrown idea was uh, really started as a as a business to business um, idea, but I think as the journey of the last year has has moved forward, that those growers are now more inclined towards a business to customer um, model. Um, and I think whilst the growing is happening, uh, has been happening and is happening in in this season, that we're talking behind the scenes about what shape homegrown here. Um, is going to take in the future. Um, it may be that we can, One minute. Thank you. We could offer um, an infrastructure for local groups or people like sustainability groups around the county who are already really passionate about local food and about wider access to that. Um, and they might act as pack or distribution hubs for the veg being grown by the homegrown heat growers. Um, we're considering how we might create a model or a network that could sit across Cumbria that different organisations and individuals can engage with, regardless of what stage they're at in terms of their own food growing or their distribution. Um, so as you can see, after year one, we achieved a great deal, but it is an evolving project and it's moving forward at the pace of the growers involved. We're also thinking about how we can engage with public sector procurement and being able to ensure that, that more food on the plates of people in Cumbria's care homes, hospitals and schools is grown in county. And we've also been invited to be part of one of the environmental land management scheme test and trials, uh, which has been mentioned earlier, uh, called Growing the Goods, which should start in May. But the takeaway message from me really is buy local, sign up to your local grower-led veg box scheme, which is not necessarily Mr. Veg, that's not a kind of shameless promotion. It's Eva's Organics, it's Growing Well in Kendall, Grow West up in the west of the county, Low Spangle Farm. There's lots of people that's growing veg out in the county, so please support us all. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Lynn. I don't know about anybody else, but all this talk of food is making me feel hungry. Um, so moving on to our third case study about the Food Carlisle Partnership, and we have Emma Mackey and Jane Maggs to talk to us for 10 minutes from the Food Carlisle Partnership. Can, as the presentation come up, can I just check? Yes, yes, yes we can see that and we can hear you fine. Jane, are you there? She might be on mute. No, I can't see her. I am on mute. I'm not now. <laughs> can you hear me? Sorry about that. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jane Maggs. I'm chair of Food Carlisle, and Emma Mackey is coordinator. Um, Food Carlisle. We've had we've had all our background given to us already by everybody else, which is great. 
So we are part, we were a founding member of the F Sustainable Food Cities, it was, Sustainable Food Cities back in 2013. It's now the Sustainable Food Places Network. It's a national partnership organisation led by the Soil Association, Food Matters and Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. Um, it brings together food partnerships across the UK um, who are driving best practice. Um, and the aim of the partnership is has six... Oh, sorry, Emma, where are we now? Oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, so obviously, as we, as we know, food is, food is part of the solution and it's also part of the problem. Um, if we look at the six um, objectives, which are here, you'll see that these are the six objectives of the Sustainable Food Places Partnership. You'll see that climate nature emergency through sustainable food and farming and ending... Oh, God. Hang on. And ending food waste is at the end. But obviously, everything is, everything is combined. Everything uh, flows into and out of each other. So if we have... If we have an equitable food system, then that will feed into um, a, better, a better world for all of us. Um, what I'd, we're not going to show you any statistics now. We're going to show you a load of pictures of what we've been doing through 2021 and the start of this year. Um, we got a modest um, food resilience grant from Sustainable Food Places. Um, and I want to tell you what we've been doing with that. And I also want to tell you a bit about a series of low carbon lunches we held leading up to COP26. And after that, Emma will talk to you about um, what we're doing at the moment. So yeah, we're very interested in the affordable food hubs and food banks. Now, a lot of people think that affordable food hubs are probably a short term solution, um, using mostly uh, food waste from such likes as fair share and supermarkets. But I have a view that if you use a certain model, which is being used currently by Wigton and Brampton, where you invite everybody, not just people on benefits, to use the food, the food um, hub, it's donation only. And what happens is you get you very quickly get a sustainable a sustainable operation into which you then can subsidise um, such such as Lynn's um, good food. You can bring in local food at a subsidised rate that everyone can then afford because the people who have money are, are actually subsidizing those people who don't. And a lot of people who have money are really interested to come because they like the idea that they're, um, they're doing their bit towards solving food waste. The other thing we've done is start a community no dig garden in one of the most deprived areas of Carlisle in a, in a landlocked site, a landlocked housing association site. We had lots of help from, from lots of organizations um, the garden itself didn't have much help from us, I can tell you. After initial planting and establishment watering, nothing much happened. The garden looked after itself and uh, we ended up with some amazing stuff. I mean, these are all the... Have you got any of the later pictures, Emma, of, of broccoli and stuff? Or Oh yeah, oh well done, yes. So, it looked after itself. The idea was that um, Cumbria Organic Gardeners and Farmers and the Master Composters, who have been mentioned before, were coming along to help. We had our first meeting planned for when all the snow came in December, so that was that was um, that was off off the agenda. But um, master composters are going to come and they're going to do demonstrations of setting up composting facilities on the site. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the other thing we did with the money was we ran a plant food and wellbeing fair right at. It was the first um, event held after lockdown ended in May. So, um, and what we wanted it to be was affordable for all because Food Carlisle is about good food for all. That's, that's simply what we're about. Um, this was embraced by the Healthy City team in Carlisle. So what we wanted it to be was um, affordable, low input, low cost, low carbon footprint, flexible and diverse because you didn't know whether it was going to have to be moved to another date or not um, sorry the event theme was 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 centered around caring for ourselves and the planet 
Um, and what happened was lots of people who nev would never have met each other, lots of groups and lots of individuals actually made it, made it together. Now, you have to remember that Food Carlisle is very tiny. It's basically Emma. I'm the chair, so I don't do much. It's basically Emma. So what we are, we're an instigator, we're a facilitator, we're a fixer in that we bring people together. And we're also, a, a what should I say? We collect, we collate information of what people are doing. So we, we're not big, we are big doers, but we're not big sort of big project runners because we can't, there isn't enough of us. Um, so what we did in this day, we made, we made fruit free available to all. We had low cost, we had at cost ice cream from, um, Abbott Hall Dairy, and we had most fantastic wood-fired pizza built by pizza oven built by a local pottery on the day. And these pizzas that you can see were made on the day by Wigton Affordable Food Hub by um, Ishka in the bottom, who's a who's an expert in pizzas. That's the potter next to her and John Crouch. We they made hundreds and hundreds of pizzas, which were given out freely on the day. Um, acknowledgement that. Food Kyle Isle is a driver for long-term sustainable change. It's illustrated that photograph from this fair is going into the uh, new uh, Kyle Isle local plan. And we think that the, this fair kind of was the ethos of what Food Kyle Isle is about. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please, Emma. Thank it's you. the Slack House one, not showing now. Uh, yeah, the Slack House is now, yeah. So, um, We'd, so I don't know what happened to the Open Farm Sunday and Gregory Greenwood. Anyway, so we helped um, Slackhouse Farm, Slackhouse Organic Farm up at Gillsland. We, de uh, de we decided to hold a, um, well, it was during Organic September. Um, we decided to hold, hold an Open Farm Day um, because what we wanted to show is what everybody else has been saying so far, that that we want to get people to think about where their food comes from, how it's produced, about food waste and its effect on the planet and also on their purses, and that individual choices are so important that you've got to, we want people to think, think about where their food comes from and what they're eating and what they're buying. So we have used the concepts of pasture for life and eating less but better meat, um, and the fact that in Carlisle District, we have a lot of farms who are intent on producing good food, even dairy and meat, without destroying the planet. Slack House is an absolute um, prime example of this. Um, we wanted people to see at first hand that high quality food can be produced on what might be termed a traditional farm like theirs. They're deeply committed to caring for the soil, increasing biodiversity on the farm and going a long way towards achieving net zero in both lifestyle on the farm. They never had so many people come to an open farm day as came to that day last, last September. The other things we did was uh, at Great Big Green Week, we, uh, we had a stall looking at food waste, but we also per per persuaded Cumbria Organic Gardeners and Farmers to do us a harvest festival. One minute. Stall. Thank you. They came up trumps, and I'm going to stop because Emma's got more stuff to talk about. You, you carry on, Emma. <laughs> um, I, I think it's more important to talk lunches. about low carbon lunches, to be honest, Jane. I can, I can present another time once right. Okay, so in the lead up to COP26, we held a series of low carbon lunches concentrating on reduction of food waste and local affordable produce um, to raise awareness that food choices are so important. Uh, we ran... We ran one for councillors, we ran one for food partners, and we ran one with churches together in Cumbria for about 100 people uh, who were pilgrims and their, and their associates going up to COP26. Clearly the uh, COP26 one was a vegan lunch, but we didn't want to scare the horses with the other two lunches. So we did have, um, we did have local meat and dairy. Uh, those sausages you can see are from Susan Aglinby's. So pasture for life. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there, Emma, because you have got lots to talk about. <laughs> we're, we're at time, I'm afraid. Um, would you want to, have you got a slide to Can I just do a quick Emma? slide on our future plans? Yeah. Uh, quickly, if that's yeah. all right. Um, so we've been working with the, sustainable, the National Sustainable Food Places Network and have fed into the National Food Strategy proposals that the government is now looking at and producing the white paper on. 
Um, we've shared our learning with the World Health Organization. So that's kind of given us some credibility that we are doing the right thing. And um, our next steps are to work with the City Council on a healthy food advertising policy, which we have already started the wheels in motion for. You'll not see any more junk food adverts on the side of the Civic Centre anymore. Um, and we're hoping to work with the um, city centre manager to have that across the city in all um, council owned uh, advertising spaces, which is obviously better for the environment if you're not getting people to eat junk food and encouraging people to eat locally as well. Um, we would like to expand all of our growing projects at the moment and continue to support Incredible Edible with their wonderful work and all this ties in with our um, silver award status. So if anyone would like to um, help support us or want to know what's going on and receive our newsletters, please just get in touch or put me an email or um, yeah, the more support we can garner in the Carlisle and the, and the district, which will be growing into Cumberland and beyond in the future. Um, please do get in touch and let me know what you're up to. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for rattling through that. Um, fantastic stuff. So moving swiftly on, we have Ellen Pierce from Food Futures talking about uh, Food Futures Lancashire's Sustainable Food Network for, for 10 minutes. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you very much. Just one second while I share. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to provide a case study. Um, I thought I'd start with a, just a quick, very quick flavour of who we are and where we are. And then I was specifically asked to cover our project working with schools and how we've worked with our local council. Um, so we're Food Futures. This is the North Lancashire Sustainable Food Places Network. Um, and we cover Lancaster District. So we're Morecambe and Morecambe Bay area, Carnforth, uh, the rural Loon Valley, and then also the city of Lancaster. And our strategy, values, approach and work plan are really all set out in our new um, community food strategy, which is a 10 year strategy for yeah, sustainable food in North Lancashire. Um, and as you can see from the the comments on the slide, uh, we did a lot of consultation and community engagement in terms of putting our strategy together. Um, and in terms of that strategy, we ended up with, uh, we did a, um, a, vision, a visioning based approach. So we looked at what, what we'd like our food system and uh, local environment to look like in the next 10 years. And then we, we kind of used a backcasting model to look at what actions we would need to take to get there. And we came up with these five kind of visions. One was around a regenerative food economy and procurement uh, process that supports that. Um, and that includes a kind of net, yeah, network of local agroecological farms or supporting like local supply chains. The right for nutritious and sustainable food for everyone and sort of more equitability around that was a key part of that as well. Um, and then healthy food, healthy environment, healthy people, theme that's already been covered. Uh, community food skills, yeah, how do we get more people uh, with the skills to grow in their backyard, make that connection with food. And then partnership working is very much at the core of how we operate as well. So in order to get there, we came up with seven kind of strategic priorities. Uh, so we've got everything in there from movement building and campaigning and celebrating stories of success and transition. Uh, we've got capacity building and really enabling and unlocking local um, spaces and resources. Um, and then a sort of personal development pathway. So how do we engage individuals and how do we bring people into this conversation? And then a big piece around sort of that continual reimagining um, and repurposing of, of what we're doing. And then in terms of how we go about operating, uh, so we have a series of working groups that work around our key themes. Um, and I guess maybe just to say we spent a lot of time looking at our internal culture and how we can, you know, be as inclusive as possible and which voices are missing and how do we sort of hold this space um, for a debate and conversation um, in a way that doesn't, you know, polarise the issues and, and disenfranchise people, which is what often happens. But moving on to the projects I was asked to talk about, uh, I was asked to talk about our work with schools. So, um, this is our project, it's called Where the Wildings Are. And we're very much at the beginning of this, but it does build on some earlier work that was done around a gardener in residence programme at local schools. And in the short term, this is um, a project to support schools in improving their grounds, um, you know, looking at what resources they have available on site, uh, both for wildlife and food growing opportunities. 
um, and looking for ways to embed outdoor learning in the curriculum and increasing opportunities for doing that. But I think we have a bigger longer term vision which is around the schools themselves becoming kind of community hubs, um, you know, sharing approaches to um, increasing biodiversity and you know local growing and really yeah really bringing people together around those themes. Um, the project um, is it's being hosted and run by coordinated by Food Futures, uh, but also in partnership with the Morecambe Bay Curriculum and the Eden Project locally. We have seven pilot schools currently, so we're just in the pilot sort of startup phase really. Uh, but we've got primary schools, secondary schools, and a specialist school. Uh, we have a coordinator, a part-time coordinator, and we're taking a permaculture design approach, uh, which is very much school-led. So there's been lots and lots of consultation with, um, with schools, both staff and students, lots of wonderful drawings from kids about how they'd like to see their spaces transformed, um, particularly for food growing. And I guess in the longer term, uh, we're hoping to see benefits in these three areas. So one is around um, yeah, the environment, so um, an increase in uh, wildlife friendly landscapes with lots of planted edible spaces, um, having dedicated space on school sites for food growing, could be orchards or you know, polytunnels, whatever fits for the individual um, environments. And through that, um, building awareness and improvements in soil health, um, biodiversity, but also kind of making habitat islands and connecting up the schools and those um, with other local green spaces. Um, we're also looking at it's very much intended to be integrated into the curriculum. So yeah, modeling this kind of healthy living, growing, eating cycle, but also providing a physical infrastructure and kind of a rhythm for um, outdoor learning and, you know, using the, the spaces and the opportunities to, to um, implement into other curriculum areas as well. And then crucially, providing the, the kind of practical um, uh, practical approach and opportunities to complement kind of the theoretical learning so not to underestimate all the benefits of yeah being out um, in the soil planting stuff um, and then we're hoping in with that sort of hub concept we're really hoping that um, you know that this will rip they'll have a ripple out effect so um, it would start to impact some of the food poverty um, issues experienced by some of the families um, engaged in those schools um, that it would help to support people um, and we can start providing support courses, etc., for people to go and um, start growing their own and embracing this kind of different lifestyle. And obviously all of the, the physical and mental health benefits that we, we understand um, in terms of being outside and um, having ownership and growing your own food. So that was a whistle stop tour of that. Um, I should say perhaps as well, sorry, that the uh, schools have co-funded that pilot phase. Um, so then we'll be, the next phase is to be looking at um, grant funding to implement all of the, um, the site specific designs which have now been created. But moving on to the other theme, um, so I was asked to talk about our links with the local council. So, um, Lancaster City Council have been a, a good partner for us in this journey. Um, they declared a climate emergency a few years ago and have um, a fairly extensive climate um, mitigation plan. Um, and they part of that was to hold a people's jury and the people's jury um, prioritised food and farming as a key theme. So that's actually been really helpful for us, obviously, in terms of meeting um, our agenda uh, but there's been a, yeah there's been a lot of synergy in, in what's been trying to been um in the plans i suppose so one thing that the um, city council have done is they've provided support and funding for our food futures coordinator so this is only a part-time role um, but for the last two years that's been co-funded by lancaster city council and that's in the budget hopefully for another five years um, so that that's obviously a huge support for us um, Food Futures also hosted, coordinated the Northern Real Farming Conference um, and Lancaster City Council provided um, the Lancaster Town Hall as a, as a venue for that. So enabling us to kind of use the buildings and resources um, really because, you know, the, the farming transition is something that they're very interested in um, and interested in impacting and understanding locally as well. 
In terms of um, building the local supply um, of food, this is an area where we have a lot of projects and a lot of work. And one of those is that we've set up a new market garden called The Plot, and we have a farm start training programme, which is all part of a wider vision to increase the supply locally. Um, so there's a kind of a ring of um, you know, farms working collaboratively and collectively around the city because we are aware that there's very little um, I mean, veg and fruit in particular grown locally. Um, and the city council um, have provided us with one of our sites. So we have a very large indoor polytunnel and some infrastructure, uh, which they provide to us on their old bedding plant nursery site. So they've been very supportive um, in that sense as well. One minute. OK, yep. Yeah. Um, obviously, we try and input to planning and strategy consultations, particularly around the new big new developments. So we have a garden village on the south of Lancaster, which is planned. Um, but probably crucially for us, two things which have made a huge difference. One is there's a cabinet role now with food responsibility. So we have one person at cabinet level who we can talk to around issues to do with local food. And that's been really good. Um, and the city council also have these amazing community connectors who are employed to uh, it, on a community wealth building agenda. So they work with local groups um, and actually one of the community connectors is currently the co-chair of our partnership. So that's been that's been really helpful as well. And then in terms of what's next, um, probably just a couple of things to mention on here. Uh, we have a big lottery funded bid uh, that's just about to start called Closing Loop. So we're also looking at composting academies, uh, re-economy um, and uh, a programme around a chef's network and promoting a North Lancashire diet or diets as well. Um, we're interested in looking also at the the pathways into farming and growing and what those models look like for people. So we've got where the wildings are, we've got the farm start, like how do we look at mapping all those paths? Um, and obviously the local schools provide um, training and development around that as well. Um, and then probably food hubs is the other area. So we've got lots of local suppliers that are not able to effectively get their um, produce to market at a, a fit in an efficient way. So yeah, how could we help and support with that theme as well? Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, so last but not least, we've got John Forbes uh, for the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership and CAFs talking about the um, ZCC Low Carbon Food Programme. Okay. Thanks very much, Karen. Can I just check that people can see the screen? Yeah. We can see uh, the uh, presenter's view. Uh, okay. I think it's probably in the interest of time, if people can still yeah. see that, I think let's move forward. I'll be as quick as I can because I realize time is very limited. And uh, as you, um, I'm sure you'll, you know that um, food is one of the key themes as part of the lottery funded Zero Carbon Cumbria project, alongside energy, transport, the things that we buy and consume. We've already heard from Lynn about the Homegrown Here project. Uh, and we also have funding as part of the from the lottery for a low carbon food program with objectives as shown on this slide. Um, all of these will contribute to our overall objective of zero carbon Cumbria by 2037 and a link to giving people, businesses and other organizations the knowledge, skills and skills to make informed decisions about food and how to take action. It's also interesting to see that these objectives have been reflected in the recommendations from the Copen People's Panel and the Youth Climate Summit, both of which are also part of the Zero Carbon Cumbria program. As examples, recommendations from the Copen People's Panel specifically mention sharing information on the carbon impact of, of produce and also supporting farmers' markets. They also recommended, uh, made a recommendation relating to the hospitality sector covering topics such as seasonal and locally sourced products, portion sizes and reducing food waste. And the Youth Climate Summit also particularly promoted, uh, recommended promoting locally sourced ingredients. Uh, our initial ideas for the food program had three main components. First, a low carbon uh, business food network. Uh, second, a uh, low-carbon food toolkit, which would build on the work which uh, at Sticklebone, which you've heard earlier. It would include an information on topics such as low-carbon food menus, case studies into low-carbon food options in Cumbria with a farm-to-fork focus, resources on why food matters, things to look out for, ways to reduce food waste, etc. Possibly a low-carbon food charter. 
And also uh, a third area would be to share experience through a series of demonstration, good practice events, podcasts, videos, etc. Given a little bit of time has passed since the bid was submitted and it was important, clearly it's important that we use the funding effectively and add value to the other projects and initiatives, many of which you've heard about this afternoon, and rather than duplicating this, we want to take this opportunity to ask you as key stakeholders three main questions. What else is out there? What are the barriers, um, particularly for, I say, so in terms of what else is out there, this is really in terms of projects, organiza uh, organizations which are advising businesses or the hospitality sector and other organizations on the things they can do to reduce carbon emissions associated with food. What are the barriers which are making it difficult for these organizations to reduce the carbon impact of the food? And then most importantly, what things could we do through the low carbon food program, which would help to address these barriers, recognizing that we only have limited budget. And there's a column on the right hand side of the whiteboard that Tim has um, uh, talked about earlier on, and Nigel has shared the link to that, where you could add your responses to these questions. As Tim mentioned, uh, the whiteboard link will stay live after this event is finished. And, and alternatively, you could get me in touch with me directly and I'll put my email into the chat. As a very whistle stop to us through the low carbon food program. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, almost bringing us in on time. Just a few closing remarks from me. Um, I think we've covered huge ground in a in the two hours from growing, marketing, consumer choice, health, all the way through to food waste. It's been fantastic. I hope it really has started off that conversation, giving everybody food for thought. Excuse the pun. Um, as, as uh, John has said, further input is possible on that whiteboard, which will remain after the event. So carry on thinking of those questions. And it's clear from the chat that people are already starting to make connections with one another. A huge thank you to all of the presenters for just telling us about all their fantastic work, their ideas, um, and for keeping to time. That's been really helpful. We do have another um, similar kind of event, cross-cutting theme event organized by the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership Events and Training Coordinator, Nigel, and that will be on alternative economics in planning on the 20th of April. Um, if you haven't already done so, sign up to the CAFS e-newsletter, which you can do on our website, because um, we promote events through that. You can follow us on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, um, uh, at, at CAFS tweets. Um, and apologies for overrunning by two minutes, but I think we've done pretty well between us, so thank you very much for for all your contributions and goodbye. Have a nice dinner tonight. <laughs>